Okay, I think, uh, I think we'll get started here, it's 9.40. Uh, I wanted to welcome you all to this uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Bernie Wu, I'm uh, with a company called Memverge, and I'm gonna talk about software-defined memory uh, and how, how we've implemented it with Loki to run big memory uh, workloads. Uh, just a quick background on the company. Uh, our company is based in uh, San Jose, California, and uh, uh, it's uh, been around since 2017, and we're a uh, software developer. So even though I'll, I'll call our solution a big memory machine, it's a piece of software that runs in uh, user space. And uh, those are some of our uh, investors. Uh, so. The problem we're trying to solve is breaking down uh, something uh, that people use in the industry, a term called the memory wall. And the memory wall can be either because of bandwidth constraints uh, on applications, applications not having enough bandwidth uh, to get mem uh, data in fast enough, or it could be capacity bound also. So both those types of barriers or walls are what we're trying to address. And so our goal is to free up these uh, these memory bound applications. So I, since we're here in Berlin, I thought I'd use this <laughs> graphic to emphasize that. Uh, and so particularly with uh, HPC and AI ML applications, we find a lot of those have this memory wall issue. And uh, the, the currently most memory is available through the DDR bus on, on, a, on a computer architecture, general system computer, uh, a general computer architecture. And that bandwidth has not kept up with the core counts of, of, of our newer machines. So that's also been one issue. And uh, the other thing that's going on is we're seeing much more diversification of compute. So people are running uh, GPUs, are running TPUs, DPUs, CPUs, uh, FPGAs, uh, all sorts of different types of accelerators. And they all need to access a, 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 the same memory pool over time. Uh, memory itself is becoming more diversified. Uh, you'll see in the next slide, uh, the uh, memory is going, expanding far beyond just being DRAM based, uh, DDR, DDR, sorry, DDR based DRAM. And then uh, very significant, uh, uh, later this year, you're, you'll start seeing uh, what we call CXL memory. So I, th I think there were a couple other talks about CXL or mentioning it at least. And that is a new industry standard uh, ac across, uh, I think there's about 210 members, basically the whole industry finally has agreed on a standard for how to have uh, coherent memory run across a, a PCIe fabric. So the initial launch of that will be uh, later this year with something called CXL 1.1. And I think over the next few years, what we're gonna see is the disaggregation of memory uh, from CPUs. Uh, so we're gonna go into some new non-von Neumann architectures where all the processors are uh, different, of various types are, are uh, accessing this memory fabric and uh, a memory pool uh, as, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, architecture. Uh, but the first step will be first to get it to run, uh, uh, expansion memory to run on a local PCIe Gen 5 bus uh, so over time, we expect memory to become a first-class citizen in the data center, like software-defined storage, software-defined memory, software-defined networking. This memory will be finally become software-defined. <clears throat> the so when I was saying memory is getting more complicated, uh, this is this is what things are going to look like uh, by the end of the year. Uh, you, you guys may have heard of HBM memory. That's basically high-speed DDR memory, but it's just right next to the, uh, literally right on top of the processor chip. Uh, then there's gonna to continue to be DDR, DRAM. Uh, there already is also persistent memory uh, from Intel, it's called, sometimes called Optane, uh, that runs also on the DDR bus. And then <clears throat> at the end of this year, the first uh, CXL connected memory system expansion cards will be available. So the memory hierarchy itself is gonna get much more complicated with latencies up at the top maybe in the 10 nanosecond level and then down at the bottom, uh, a CXL connected uh, memory expansion card is expected to be equivalent to uh, one NUMA hop away from uh, whatever your process is running. So 
uh, latencies on the order of, uh, you know, 100, 200 nanosecond or, or range. Uh, and to, to deal with this new hierarchy of big memory, of memory, uh, uh, which is going to address both capacity and bandwidth, uh, we need software. So, uh, so that's what Memverge is working on, how to virtualize this software, create different pools and different tiers based on uh, latency distances, and then also to uh, w operate underneath applications to profile their behavior and then do what we call auto tiering, where we uh, promote and demote memory pages based on the heat maps. And I'll show you some examples later on. And then also we've added uh, some memory data services. So one of the most important ones we see is uh, snapshotting. So we are able to take now a high speed memory snapshot of, of the entire uh, application's uh, memory state plus the associated machine state and, and capture that. It can also be coordinated with the storage, data storage, uh, so that we can move uh, applications more quickly from maybe one instance to another. Uh, this is something we're doing right now on the public cloud with things like Amazon, Spot Fleet, and things like that. Uh, uh, Spot instances or Azure, same thing. So this is the, the memory machine itself, uh, our, our software stack. Uh, and uh, uh, let me start by, by saying, first of all, it runs again on, uh, on, the, on top of the uh, Linux kernel and user space. Uh, right, below, right above it are the applications, and the applications are currently for us, we've been focused on uh, the most memory intensive ones, and a lot of those are in the HPC uh, AI ML area. And uh, <clears throat> again, we create this pooling and this auto tiering, uh, and it's designed to all work transparently with your application. So our goal is to make your application without modification run better, <laughs> uh, run better or faster, and I'll show you examples in, in just a minute. And then also we have this, again, this snapshotting capability. And uh, uh, so besides these uh, specific applications, we can actually run underneath uh, of VMs or, or even the KVM hypervisor. And uh, so we see potential use cases, and this is where we want to explore partnerships with you folks for doing quick rollbacks of, of perhaps during system maintenance operations or, or taking system machines out of service, that kind of thing. I, I believe this memory snapshot tool can be uh, valuable in shortening those outage periods. Uh, and then also we've done work if you can see this uh, red uh, area on, the, on that diagram, to uh, integrate with various orchestration platforms. So we, we have Ansible, we support Ansible, we've integrated with Slurm, LSF, UGE, some various storage uh, uh, systems directly. Uh, we haven't done Cinder yet, but that's probably on the list to do next. Uh, and then Amazon, Azure, and then obviously we wanna do uh, more work uh, coordinating with, with Loki. Uh, so we do have things like uh, Kubernetes operators and OpenShift certifications, but there's a lot more work we need to do in that area. <clears throat> These are examples of the use cases that we've already uh, uncovered with this big memory. Uh, and again, most of them are, I would characterize as data in intensive in the simulation, uh, HPC, AI, ML area, uh, genomics. Uh, we're doing a lot of work. I'll show you a couple examples there. Uh, EDA, uh, electronic design automation. Some of these jobs take a, a long time to run. Their, their verification tests, uh, 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 and they use a, a lot of uh, memory. So some of them can run for weeks. So we're not only adding big, big memory, but we're also adding this transparent memory snapshotting. So if, if for some reason the system goes down or it gets crashes or wants to take advantage of a lower cost off-peak instances, we can help, we, we help um, move the applications onto those environments. Uh, AI, ML, a lot of this GPUs are, are memory starved in the sense that they, <laughs> they process faster, they can ingest memory. So us acting as a cache in front of those, especially for some larger, some of these image-based uh, image uh, deep learning things, uh, we found use cases, media and entertainment, Simulation of uh, you know tools like uh, Houdini, Blender, things like that. Uh, we we can we can help with those. Some of them require large amounts of memory as well, or they need to be rolled back for for uh, an artist wants to to uh, iterate on a, on a on a design that kind of thing. 
uh, HPC, uh, physical modeling, uh, quantum chemistry, that kind of stuff, FSI. Uh, we've done some work, if you go to our website, with like people like Hazelcast to speed up uh, recovery time, recovery point objectives for in-memory databases, uh, which is also that next point. And then also we just started working with some of the uh, public clouds, but I'm hoping to, we, we, we can engage this community and, and, and add value here also. And the, the value we see here is we can help densify both containers and virtual machines, lower the total cost of ownership, uh, lower the power consumption because persistent memory takes a lot less power, maybe 10% of the power of a DRAM. Uh, it doesn't leak like a, a DRAM capacitor does. Uh, and, then, uh, and then again, help bring HPC workloads into uh, this, this community. <clears throat> so these are, I'm just gonna run through some examples of of these use cases. Uh, so here's here we're running MySQL in a KVM environment and the first column there, all black. Uh, and, and what we're showing on the uh, y-axis is the uh, queries per second and then uh, then uh, different mixes of PMEM and DRAM. So again, we're into tiering. So the first column is 100% DRAM, the second column is 100% PMEM. So obviously the last four columns are different blends that, that fall in between. So. Uh, so there may be uh, there may be a slight performance degradation, or, or in sometimes in the last column there we actually topped it uh, through a little bit of tuning. Uh, so that's just to give you an idea of 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 how PMEM and DRAM are are associated. Now PMEM is, I think, on the uh, on the right side. I think is 300 nano 300 nanoseconds versus 100 nanoseconds. So in some cases PMEM is slower. Uh, on the uh, right and then fast uh, equivalent of speed on the reads, I think. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, snapshotting, uh, the other thing that's going on is the memory, as the memory gets bigger and bigger, uh, the outage, the, the, the recovery time to rewarm this memory, replay back the logs or whatever you have to do to recover a system that's crashed takes longer and longer. And so we can be used in conjunction, uh, we can use a memory snapshot which uses a copy on write technology to take a very, very quick snapshot of the application and the memory and machine state. And then uh, we could either store that in persistent memory if it's available. If it's not, like in the case of something like uh, an Amazon cloud, we currently dump it into the, an S3 object, but we can do that asynchronously. So we are not tying up, the holding up production while we're draining it off to a, uh, the, the, the memory into an object. Uh, so, so we can really compress the recovery time objective, make uh, snapshotting more viable. Uh, and this is important too, because in the HPC world, a lot of applications uh, never were designed for checkpoint and recovery. And, uh, and so they, they just run and they crash, you start all over again and you may have lost 30 days. Uh, here, we, we can prevent that. And also from a sysadmin standpoint, uh, we, we found that there's a lot of people using systems where they need to clear off a bunch of capacity so they can run a live experiment on this, uh, on this uh, computing architecture. And, and so, they, so the sysadmin wants to go in there and transparently shut down all, a whole bunch of applications and hibernate them somewhere and then bring them back after they've done their experiments. So there's, there's a variety of use cases like that for snapshotting. And, uh, and again, this just illustrates how fast we, we can restore. This is a Redis database at 300 million keys it took 15, it would take 15 minutes normally to drain the memory just to, to preserve this, the state of this uh, Redis database. But if there's persistent memory available, it can be done in a half a second. Uh, this is another example. We've done a lot of work in the, uh, in the genomics area in particular. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, things like uh, single cell uh, RNA sequencing uh, or population studies uh, where a huge amount of memory is needed. A lot of times there's a matrix of the, the gene types on one column and then on the rows or whatever are all the all those samples for different uh, populations. So in cancer research, it's a st statistical game, and so you have to mine this huge matrix. And uh, a lot of times there's also issues with these instruments. They have to be calibrated or you have to iterate a lot because calibrations or parameters have to be tweaked. So the, the pipelines get very complicated and uh, we're, we've been able to uh, compress a lot of these pipelines down. Uh, this is an example. So what you're seeing on the, the y-axis are uh, uh, runtime in, in seconds. So the higher the, the bar, the worse it is, the lower is better. 
so after we helped uh, uh, adjust this pipeline, uh, you can see uh, the black columns are the result after we've adjusted this pipeline. Now, a lot of the trick to this is actually uh, getting rid of IOs and, and leaving everything in memory. So with a bigger pool of memory, we don't have to have so many temp files and swapping. That consumes a huge amount of time. If you look at a lot of HPC workloads, sometimes you spend 25, 30% of the entire runtime on I.O. And I'll, I'll show you some profiles like that. And, and, and just by, so even though they're technically not big memory applications, by giving them a big memory pool, we can get rid of a lot of that I.O. to disk and, uh, or SSD and, 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 and drastically compress the uh, execution time. So in this case here, we reduce the execution time by about 60%. Uh, and then, yes, and then if they need to roll back, uh, there, there are certain use cases where you need to roll back and do tuning or debugging. Uh, I, I think there's opportunities actually in the security sector to do forensics. You know, you have a snapshot of this thing, so you can try to figure out what happened. So uh, instant rollbacks, I think, are valuable. Uh, and again, because we're doing a real, a true memory snapshot, not just cause, freezing a system and draining it slowly, uh, we, can, we can, I think, uh, come up with new uh, use cases. And I'd be interested if you guys have any ideas as well. And then another example here is metagenomics. Uh, we'll, we'll be publishing a paper at the ISMB next month. It's the, uh, the, the, the premier computational biology conference uh, up in Wisconsin. Uh, and metagenomics is uh, the field of studying uh, complex biomes, like your, your stomach has, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of different unknown bacteria and, and critters in your stomach. Same with a sample of soil. Uh, so everybody knows we've, we've, we've mapped, you know, yeast cells, human cells, DNA, but there's a lot of unknowns out there that we don't know that affect climate change and things like that or our digestive systems. So that area is very interesting to research, and we've been able to uh, now be able to run on commodity uh, uh, Intel servers, what normally would have taken a much larger uh, complex, maybe 50 to 100 nodes on a supercomputing complex. Uh, so there's this particular workload, it's called a metas metaspades, uh, that uh, creates a large graph. So basically, uh, when you look at a sample of DNA, you only get two or 300 uh, segment pieces of DNA. And, and those are all mixed up with thousands of other organisms. So it's like t going into a library, taking all the books off the shelf in a library, throwing them all in a paper shredder, shredder, and then handing this pile of shreds and saying, put all the books back together. You know, that's what this kind of, uh, of application does. And it takes a long time. In this case, it takes 11 days to run. And uh, it likes a lot of memory because it's actually building a giant graph. And, and graphs are hard to partition, especially when you don't know anything about the graph in advance. So, uh, so here we end up in this application. We end up running uh, roughly uh, 20, 20 to one ratio of, of gigabytes per core, uh, and we're able to execute this on on uh, on a standard Intel. Well, that's not a, it's a high end ninety six core uh, uh, system using two terabytes of memory. And so these profiles are just showing how how much of a beast this application is. It, it, the top one is CPU utilization. You can see it gets topped out all the cores. And then the next one is the, the memory, tops out at two terabytes. Uh, and this is a, a, over time. So you're seeing it cycle as it goes through its workload. And then the bottom two uh, are, are disk reads and disk writes. So we didn't even get around to optimizing disk reads and disk writes and getting rid of some of those. We just ran this application as is and uh, we're able to execute it and uh, in some cases, compress the wall clock time, but, but also more importantly, able to checkpoint this thing because a lot of times something will crash just out of, out of, out of some random situation and we're able to, because we have these checkpoints, we can recover this application. Another example is in the, in the uh, <coughs> automobile design area. There's an application called NASTRAN that's used for uh, noise vibration heart, harshness testing. And this is an example where a, a good portion of the duty cycle the first part of this graph where that black line is, is all the disk activity. So the first you know, third of this thing is a lot of disk activity. We, we are, our profilers are aware of that, so we'll actually act, allocate more memory to disk caching. And then later on, we find it's not using so much. Now we take all the memory and use it, the DRAM, and use it tiered with a PMEM. And we're able to, and, and so you can see the last part of this thing, 
is basically a flat usage of about 1.2 terabytes of memory, uh, memory and PMEM combined actually, and uh, it's just maxed out, it's just doing computations. And so when you dissect that pipeline, there's about nine stages to it. These are all the stages. And what I'm doing is comparing wall clock time of DRAM only versus wall clock time with a combination of DRAM and PMEM that is cost equivalent. So when I say cost equivalent, uh, PMEM is, is on a cost per gigabyte is half the cost of, of DRAM. So, uh, so we actually are able to expand the memory at the same price, same number of slots, and, and then drive down the wall clock time by 25%. So it's 8,000 versus 6,000 seconds. Now, in a real production environment, the data sets would be 10 times larger than this one. So you can add another zero after that, It'd be 83,000 seconds versus 62,000 seconds, which is quite a lot of time, 20,000 seconds saved. Uh, and to help our, our partners deploy this tool, because not everything, not every workload is a good uh, uh, tiering candidate. Some, some applications may be highly, highly, highly random accessing, uh, like this, this first application. So we have a tool that we offer to our partners. Uh, the green envelope here, sorry, it's hard to read, is the total memory being consumed by this application. The, the red area bar chart here, this is a, this is a real time uh, profiler that can be piped into Prometheus and Grafana and that kind of thing. But uh, th this red area is the uh, hot, what we consider the active memory pages, the number of active, the, the percentage or the amount of this memory that's active. So you can see in this, second example, the second application, there's a lot of un, underutilized memory or, or, or basically quiet memory. It's not, it's not active. So it looks like, you know, just eyeballing it, it's probably 80, 90, 80, 90 percent of this memory is, is largely inactive. And therefore, it's ideal for as a tiering candidate to be used in con conjunction with our automatic tiering and, uh, and use something like persistent memory to co cut costs. So now I'd like to in the last uh, few minutes here, talk a little bit about how we're starting to work with the Loki and, and uh, uh, community and integrate this software-defined memory into it. So the, let me first start off with the, the value proposition. I think for, the, for an operator, uh, I think one of the benefits is we can increase the density of virtual machines and containers, plus we provide what we call noisy memory isolation. You know, in storage, sometimes you worry about noisy neighbor isolation or things like that. There's an analogous problem if you don't design your memory architecture correctly. So we have noisy, what we call noisy memory isolation. Helps keep the quality of service consistent. And then also lower the, the, the total cost of ownership. Uh, you may or may, may or may not be familiar with this, but uh, on the, in the VMware community, they, they announced in November something called the Capitola Project, where basically they're installing uh, memory, building in memory tiering into their to their uh, hypervisor to allow it to uh, tier between uh, DRAM and persistent memory. It basically in the exact same fashion that I'm, I'm describing here. And that will allow them to cut costs so they have the same value proposition. They're gonna be uh, pushing to densify sometimes up to 25% the number of VMs or containers per node uh, on, on, your, on, your, on your existing systems. Uh, and another big benefit of this is uh, lowering the carbon footprint. Uh, the, uh, I'll show you a, a diagram in a second, but uh, persistent memory can sometimes use as little as one-tenth the power of, of DRAM. Uh, and then uh, I believe this also, along with our checkpointing technology, is, is, and, and, the allow, uh, and, and addressing some of these memory-bound issues will help bring more HPC AI ML applications to, to uh, uh, Loki-based clouds. And then, uh, and again, I think uh, if you're an operator and you have off-peak off instances, this will allow uh, customers that couldn't take advantage of those off-peak uh, instances to use them because we can, again, do this transparent checkpointing even if it's an application that was never designed to be fault tolerant. And then for the users, you can see the similar benefits. They, they can run HPC applications uh, a lot of times people need to burst things up onto, uh, uh, because they're out of, out of local capacity, they need to burst things into a cloud. Uh, and we can help on bursting because uh, of the, uh, we can increase the agility of the application with these memory snapshots and, uh, for, for big memory applications. And then, um, uh, let me go on here. So this, this gives you a quick 
idea of how much power savings there is. There's a, the latest generation, the 200 series of Intel PMEM, 512 megabytes per uh, gigabytes per, per uh, memory stick uh, is, as you can see, one-tenth the power of a regular DRAM. Uh, so I think uh, in some sustainability, people who have sustainability issues should take a look at this. Uh, if you're starting out with a green field, you could actually deploy fewer servers uh, and use a blend. This, in this example, we're just using a two-to-one blend of DRAM uh, and PMEM. That's a pretty conservative mix. Uh, and that contrasts with the DRAM-only systems uh, and uh, you can take out a lot of costs here. We're talking about a 25% reduction in, in, in hardware, procurement, or hardware procurement costs. And then uh, regarding the noisy neighbor issue, uh, the, there's a native PMEM uh, memory mode with persistent memory, uh, and uh, what we're showing is a comparison of, uh, of, 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 of memory operations uh, versus uh, uh, threads. And so each process has, is grouped in you know, a four, each application is four threads a piece. And you can see there's a lot of variation in, in the native uh, kernel-based memory mode with our uh, user space memory, uh, memory uh, tiering architecture, see a much more consistent behavior across uh, the, uh, all, all your applications, uh, process threads. So that's what I mean by uh, getting rid of noisy neighbor problems with memory. And that applies both to containers and VMs. These are some deployment scenarios uh, for running us in this Loki area. We can run on bare metal, uh, which is this first column here. We can run uh, as part of, we can run underneath the uh, KVM hypervisor. And then because we're a Linux only application, the KVM abstracts us sufficiently so that there are, there are Windows uh, CAD CAM applications like from Autodesk, that can now be run and take advantage of big memory that, that are always memory bound. Uh, there are, uh, in, this, in this use case here, we're just plopped into the particular VM and providing uh, uh, memory services just to particular applications. So, so we can be very granular. We, we can pick which applications or which VMs or containers to provide the memory services. So uh, what I'm saying is we don't have to be deployed across the board in your cloud. You can, you can stick your toe in the water create a, a group of, of, of a machine class that has, uh, that, that has the uh, augmented uh, memory capabilities and then offer those out. Or you, like I said, you can deploy on a case-by-case -case basis inside of machines. Or it, this last one here is, is a, a container implementation. Uh, again, we do have the uh, uh, Kubernetes and slash OpenShift operator. Uh, so that one's all automated. And, and down below here, we're showing PMEM, but Again, by the end of this year, you're going to start seeing uh, CXL uh, uh, complete solutions start to, to ship, and uh, starting with uh, local memory expansion cards. So for us to get it to work uh, on the OpenStack side, we currently have to make a few modifications to, to Nova to add a flavor. Uh, and, and then once that flavor is, is uh, uh, instantiated, then you're you're up and running basically. So we can talk more about that after this talk if you're interested. Uh, and then again, we've been working with Red Hot, so we recently got our certifications for the uh, an operator on uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift. And so my my call to action uh, is, uh, you know, help us partner with us, help us break down this memory wall and free these memory bound applications. Uh, and for further reading, uh, there are a couple links here. This is one is a white paper we published with Intel that's on the, uh, I think it's on the Red Hat, uh, it's actually on the Intel site, also on the Red Hat uh, Marketplace site about what we've done with Kubernetes and containers. And this is a, the metagenomics paper that's going to be presented next month uh, at the ISMB in, uh, in the US. So I think I'll stop there unless anybody has any questions. I think we have one minute. Does, does this make sense to anybody? <laughs> Good. Yeah, I, I think it's exciting. I think uh, virtualization is finally, you know, this, this is the last frontier of virtualization as far as I'm concerned. The memory area has always been tethered to uh, CPUs, and now because of the diversity of compute, uh, it needs to have its own first-class status, and, and also there's going to be a lot more choices now. Uh, 
for, for people as far as memory bond applications. Okay, if there's no questions, then uh, I wanna thank you for your time and then uh, I'll hang around here for a few minutes if you wanna just talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Also our, uh, our COO sitting back there, John Jang, if you wanna to talk to him as well. Thanks. <laughs>